Hi there, everybody, and welcome once again to All Things Irish and Rock and Roll. My name is Benny Point, and speaking of All Things Irish and Rock and Roll, it's been a pretty bad year, uh, about 15 months, really. Um, with the COVID, it has completely stopped us all from playing and doing the thing that we love. But not only that, we've lost some great musicians here in Dublin. We've lost uh, Philip Donnelly, who died just before the COVID lockdown begun. We've lost the late, great Ditch Cassidy. Uh, Lee McKenna, I only heard recently, has passed away in the UK. And only a few days ago, uh, the wonderful Noel Bridgman. So what can you say about Noel that hasn't been said already? Uh, some people like to call him Nullick, but he was a wonderful, wonderful drummer. He was a wonderful accordion player. He was a super singer who sang with soul conviction. Um, he really did. And uh, he was also a great golfer. And Brendan Fingus, of course, will attest to this. Uh, Brendan and um, Noel were great buddies on the golf course for years going back. And I had the pleasure sometimes of playing with Noel and Brendan too. But you have to remember the accomplishments that, that Noel has accomplished, if you like. I mean, he was with the original Skid Row with Gary Moore. Uh, he's been with the Gentry, the Platterman, in which I sang for a year with him, had the great pleasure. Mary Black, Van Morrison, The Business, uh, Red Peters, uh, Colin Wilkinson, and many, many more. Many, many more. And he's on lots of recordings. And uh, unfortunately, as I said, he was taken away from us four days ago. Now, four years ago, Brendan Finglas and myself got him into the studio and we recorded an interview. And we, for some reason or other, had not uh, fully edited it. So Brendan called on uh, Noel a few, a couple of years ago to come out and view the video uh, before we put it out on, on uh, the air. But... Anyway, Noel was delighted. He loved it and he went away. That's all we heard. Then Brenda Fingers got a call from Noel saying, yeah, go with it. Just take out the controversial bits. And that's what I'll call them. A couple of controversial bits, which uh, Brenda was able to edit out. So please give it up for possibly uh, Noel Bridgman's last interview uh, from 2016. And um, rock on Noel, that's all we can say. And thanks for all the years of uh, incredible musicianship. God bless you. Got into music first when I was a kid. Started playing the accordion. And uh, it was brilliant, brilliant playing, uh, I think. It was a f like, like all instruments, it's a form of escape. And uh, got into the accordion big time. Really loved it, loved practicing. Loved playing, loved the sound of it. And then uh, the Beatles came along, the Stones, the Kinks, all the Liverpool sound suddenly erupted in Ireland. In those days, everything was very, uh, Dublin was very dull and very dark. Very priest ridden. What you could look forward to most was like Tuesday night and Friday night going to Sodality, <laughs> wearing the scapulars up in, the, up in Dominic Street with the Dominicans. So, uh, and then suddenly the music thing happened. And then said, uh, suddenly everyone was trying to get a Beatle haircut and Beatle shoes. I had curly hair and I'd be trying to straighten it, straighten it, straighten it, you know. And, and by the end of the night, it'd be out like that little sport, you know. Remember <laughs> little sport? <laughs> the hair, the hair like, I couldn't get the hair down, it was too curly for it to be a Beatle like. And then, of course, along came Hendrix and all them boys, and that curly hair was cool then. Um. Yeah, I got into the drums and started, uh, I heard the Beatles first, the Kinks, all these people, start banging the sides of uh, the armchair with sticks and the, the clouds of dust to be flying up in the, <laughs> in the sitting room. And uh, eventually I persuaded my dad to, and he, 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 fair play to him, he got me a kit of drums. He knew somebody down the road who could order them in. Because it was quite difficult even to get instruments then. Got in a kit of drums. I remember them, a black mother of pearl kit, premier kit. I think Downey had a kid similar as well. He had a blue mother apparel kid, Premier. Brian did. <coughs> um, 
So I just sort of jumped straight into the playing the drums. I didn't really take any, I didn't get any lessons, so I didn't learn. So I'll just talk about myself for a while, Bernard, if you don't mind. Please. Uh, how I got into the drums. So I just started playing the drums and just battering away and listening to, uh, listening to bands and just trying to copy it and whatever, or not knowing really what I was doing. And uh, it just so happened then that uh, I played with a couple of garage bands, you know, like uh, all young kids, it was great. But then the brush started going with a girl next door, Margaret, who's now his wife. And I got to know Brandon. At that time, he was, uh, he, like he was, uh, uh, at 14 years of age, he was playing with Rose Tynan. So uh, already he was at 14. So like for, for poor people, I'd say poor, I'd say working class maybe, people then, it was a way out. Because uh, higher education was only a thing for the, the middle classes and the wealthy really. Like the, the, the furthest you could go in public schools and was the leave insert. I managed to get to get to, to a leave insert until I was 17. But Brendan was out gigging when he was 14. So he was putting a band together. He was gigging with a band called the Uptown Band. You must remember Mojo. Yeah. You'd remember all these. Mojo and uh, Brenny Bonas. Mm -hmm. uh, Desi Reynolds, mm -hmm. one of the great Irish drummers. Great. Desi was initially in the Uptown Band. I think he was replaced probably by Paddy Nash. Great. Do you remember Paddy? Mm -hmm, do you? Paddy, Lord rest him now. Great singer. Mm. Great drummer. Really terrific. Um, I'll keep this brief. I joined Brennan. He formed Skid Row with Philo, Bernard Cheevers, myself. Can I show you a photograph? Yeah. So it was a four piece? Four piece, yeah. yeah. I'll show you a photograph. This was before Gary Moore arrived on the scene. Let me see if I can just quickly take this out here. There's no rush anyway, sure there's not. No, okay. We will be scanning those on it. Yeah. There's a great photograph there. Look at that, Bernard. Just hold it up there for the camera. You might scan this later on. Yeah. But that's a really great photograph. Do you see that? An old uh, black and white. Look at, isn't that brilliant? Great. I don't know who took it. Probably. Roy Esmond. No, probably. Do you remember the, the uh, photographer that died recently? Liam Quigley. Liam Quigley. That's. You swear that shot was actually taken yesterday, isn't it? So good. It's brilliant. So clear, yeah. It's absolutely brilliant. And there's yeah. fellow in the back, a young fellow. Yeah, that's great. So then uh, Bernard had to Bernard went on to do other things. Bernard was an electrician, so he decided that he wouldn't go professional. That's probably why he's still alive. <laughs> <laughs> Gary joined the band. He was only 15 when he came down from Belfast. 15, so you're talking about a time when, like, that would be unheard of now for parents to let a son come down at 15 years of age. But already at that stage, he was showing incredible promise as a player <clears throat> at that young age. And uh, so, the band was from Skid Row was formed with Gary Moore, Philo. I have a few photographs there, I'll show you. Philo, myself, Brush. Uh, until eventually, Philo went his own way. Uh, I think the Brush realised that Philo really wanted to do his own thing, so he gave him his bass and told him, go off and do your own thing, showed him a few things. So th that became a three piece. Uh, <clears throat> And so on. That went its own way then, that particular band. Skid Row. Skid Row, Skid Row. It was a great band. I, we had a, I had a great time. Tell us about America. America was sensational. Like for a bloke from where, for, for us, where we came from, like Philip was from Crumlin, with me, Seth and Brennan were from the inner city. And suddenly to end up in the, in the shores of America, to arrive in America at that young age, like playing music, it was just like, it was a dream. It was unbelievable. We never thought about money or anything like that, which in hindsight is a big mistake. We didn't care about business or anything like that. And we worst mistake of all, we trusted everybody. <laughs> Bad mistake. <laughs> we had a fantastic time. And we had no money because all the money was going to the manager. 
So we, we li I think we lived on $5 a day, which virtu is virtually nothing. That's just subsistence. Is this promoting a record or mm. just doing gigs? Yeah, the manager, like, he made a big mistake where <clears throat> at the time he was managing Fleetwood Mac, who were a really popular band. Huge they were. And he sort of forced the American record company to take us over there when they said they weren't ready for us. They didn't have time to put anything together. But he insisted and he threatened them with pulling Fleetwood Mac on them if they didn't do it. So they had to do it. So therefore we were sort of all over the place and it was a dartboard thing. We were young, we didn't realise what was really going on behind the scenes at that time. And because of that we suffered in a sense through lack of exposure. Whereas when we were in America, we had actually had a hit in Sweden. That's where we should have been. But instead, so that was bad management there for anyway for a start. And of course we signed we signed contracts which were which would be illegal now. The first contract we signed was for, with CBS was for <laughs> for a half percent between us. A half of one percent between us. This, we trusted everybody. You just thought, yeah, mm. trust everybody because everybody smiled at you and everybody was very nice to you. You're going to be millionaires. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, we were playing the music and it was a great, it was a fantastic lifestyle. And you, as Jimmy Doyle would say, we were up on stage there and we were having a great time. You weren't thinking about your bank account. Not like the bands that came later, who some bands, that's all they thought about was their bank account. And uh, so... Then Skid Row broke up, uh, Gary went on to do different things and... Uh, Can you remember the clubs you played in Dublin? The clubs? Yeah, what type of clubs and where did you play in Dublin or? At that time? Before you went to America, say, when you... The uh, Five Club? Yeah. Was one great place. There was lots of places. You see, in those days, Bernard, even though the country was supposedly poverty stricken, there was gigs everywhere. There was every yacht club had a gig. Mm. Every tennis club had a gig. We're talking the sixties here. Yeah. Late sixties. Yeah. Like in Parnell Square alone. Now you'll remember this. In Parnell Square alone, right? Let's count them. The National, the Kingsway, the Matt Talbot, Iron. George's Hotel, the Iron, the Town and Country Club, the Belvedere Hotel, mm. Barry's Hotel. Like, we're up to eight gigs, and that was without the Cayley Hops, mm. or the clubs, the scene club, mm. that were in the, that were in Parnell Square alone. Now, we're talking about ten gigs before you even went down into O'Connell Street. Mm -hmm. And when you went down to O'Connell Street, you had the Go-Go. Mm -hmm. You had the Metropole, you had the Capitol, you had the Ballroom in the Capitol. That's, that was unbelievable. You had Sound City, and you the had the apartment. Place. Like, there was gigs everywhere, and yet the country was poverty-stricken. Yet there was gigs everywhere. And speaking of poverty stricken, explain this to me. Or I wish the government of today could explain this to me. How in a country that was poverty stricken, they managed to build Ballyferma, Cabra, Fingers, Donny Carney, Crumlin, Drimba. Thousands of houses for so social houses. Yet they can't build 20 now. Can someone explain that to me? When the country was poverty stricken, they built thousands of houses that are still standing. Incredibly strong built houses. Anyway, sorry, we're getting we're getting sort of sidetracked there. But it was the same thing. The music business was absolutely brilliant in Ireland. But we decided that like to be like all Irish acts, if you're any good, why don't you go away? <laughs> See, uh, to be accepted in Ireland, you really have to make it somewhere else. Because the Irish, as I said, suffered from a huge inferiority complex. Like, which is, I suppose, it's something to do with the colonisation of 700 years of being battered into the ground, you know. And uh, so I think that has something that's uh, endemic in the Irish way of thinking. Uh, thankfully, that's all changing now. Slowly, with the advent of people who have become world successes, like Conor McGregor. <laughs> Good man, Conor. <laughs> you know, great. I am and, the uh, what? I and am he's the not the, yeah, he's not to do with music. Although he got beaten the other night. But I, that's what happens when you take on a bigger bloke, then you. A big, one, good big one. What did I say? A good big one will always be the good small one. That's the nature of it. But he's still the greatest featherweight that's ever 
happened in that thing. Anyway, sorry, Connor, we move on. Where were we, Bernard? Yeah, we huge, these, huge yeah, amount of gigs yeah. in, in Dublin. Mm. Brilliant, like gigs everywhere. Mm. And I was making more money then, then, you know, like, it was great. Mm. It was fantastic. We had plenty of money to go out drinking every night, which we did do and had a great time. Then we went to London. Is this Skid Row now? It's a Skid Row. Okay. Sorry, I've got, I'm, I'm jumping all over the place, okay. but it doesn't really matter. We can pull it together. Yeah, and then from there to America and back again. But eventually the band broke up. And that's when, um, I suppose you've heard the expression, the dark night of the soul. That's, I, I feel like that. When the band broke up, that uh, that was my life. So I went through a very, very bad patch then. The, this, they call it the dark night of the soul, where you start to get lost in the wilderness and you don't know and you lose your, your confidence in your ability to play. And then... You get back to Dublin and it's all very, very strange. I have to sell half my gear to get home, you know, and people think you're a star or a rock star and you've got nothing. It's from America? Well, from England. From England. England America, back to England, then back to, to Dublin because uh, when things collapsed in London, I had nowhere to live. So I was just staying with people that I knew and after a while you outstay your welcome. And uh, so I sold, had to sell half my gear to get me fair to get home. And then, uh, and I'm not sure where I went. My memory is very, very hazy about all that era. And uh, you sort of, then I made the mistake of uh, just trying to destroy your, your ego. You, you sort of, you, when you get slapped, you lose, when you lose your confidence and you're, then I tried to destroy my ego, which is very, very, that's a bad mistake to make. And uh, eventually, it took me a long time to sort of come back, probably 20 years, maybe even longer, to come back. And I was very lucky along the way because I picked up gigs that I was able to survive and raise a family. I was very, very lucky. And I always very, very lucky to, we moved into the gentry, I moved into the gentry, which was, Smashing band. Yeah. Then we moved into the Platinum and you were there, but that was another great band. Mm -hmm. They were great bands. They were like fantastic bands. Mm -hmm. Do you know? And uh, I suppose people don't understand, like people equate success with ability. It's got nothing to do with it. Nothing. Like, if you were to say, you've heard it say, Dame, What's her name? Barbara Cartland. Mm. Right, she writes all the romantic novels. Mm. Right? Now she's probably sold millions and millions of copies. She sold more copies than James Joyce. But does that make her a better writer? <laughs> Just, you know what I mean? So you have to be careful about success. And sometimes the biggest gobshites are really successful. And the really great people don't get a look in. It's funny, I was just reading... Uh, uh, um, a book about Caesar, because I, ha I had to write this down. I was reading it this morning, and I said, geez, that's great. I said, it is common for those who flourish under any system to feel that the failure of others is deserved. Do you know what I mean? Now, that, it's not like that, but it, that's a brilliant way of putting it, that sometimes brilliant people get nowhere. We know that. You know, but if you're a good business person and a good, you have your head like geared to your bank account, mm -hmm. you can be very, very successful, as we know, like about certain people. I won't say their names. Do you want their initials? <laughs> it's but, interest. Yeah, but Jimmy Dial, if you look at the interview that Jimmy did, like he puts it really in a, in a nutshell, you know, that sometimes yeah. people get to incredible heights that they don't deserve, you know, and. And the trouble is that that sounds like sour grapes, but it's not. We're talking about we're talking about music here, and we're talking about uh, the Irish music scene and how it developed. Now, Jimmy made some great points about you could be good, you could be a big frog in a little pond here. You go to London, and you suddenly realise that you're just a tiny little frog, because these boys have been at it for so long. And he was talking about the advent of the, of the music coming in from America. 
into Liverpool, into England on the boats by American sailors, drifting down into London, being played. All the great jazzers, this is the way it happened. Then it's filtered across to Dublin. So it was delayed reaction in Dublin, really. Do you know what I mean? So, um, Well, you said it yourself, Noel. I mean, you're playing now in maybe two bands with just the most amazing musicians. Absolutely astounding. I'm really, here I am, yeah. Bernard. I'm yeah. still alive. Yeah. And I'm playing better than I ever played. Because I really, of these guys. Be, because of all, and because of all playing with these people. Like if you look at the amount of musicians I've played with, it's just like I said, oh, Bruce like was a great bass player in, like he doesn't play bass now, but then like he was really fantastic player. Then we got to play with Lee McKenna, mm -hmm. was a super bad player. Oh, God, we got Rob Strong, mm -hmm. Tommy Moore, John Querney. Look at all that, like, there's, there's just so many, I could go on forever playing with people. Look at how lucky we are, to, I, I, well, sorry me, how lucky I am to have played with great guitar players. Like, Bernard Cheevers initially, who was way ahead of the posse at that time, Bernard was a su superb guitar player. Gary Moore, who went on to world-class player. Um, Brian Harris, the gentry, Ed Dean. Another, like these are people who are magnificent players. Jimmy Faulkner. Jimmy, Jimmy Faulkner. R.I.P. Like, the, the, the list is endless. Mm. Do you know? And I was very lucky to be, even though I was going through my dark night of the soul or whatever we call it, that I actually met up with these musicians and got to play with them mm. and was accepted by them, yeah. which is very, very healthy for your head mm. to be accepted by people. And uh, so then, I got to play with great people, got to play with The Brush again, got to play with Jimmy Slevin. I have photographs there, I'll show you. Jimmy Slevin, another great guitar player who went on to Germany. Uh, Timmy Creedon, myself and Timmy played two, the two drums. Dave Gaynor, we played two drum kits mm. together. Like, these are really class musicians. Like, so I, in that sense, I was very lucky to meet these people along the way that actually, came. and also to be able to make a living and raise a family which is the most important thing of all, because now I have family, I have grandchildren, which sustain me. Will I keep going? Will I just keep talking? Please. Um, yeah, and as I said, Bernard, I'm playing better now than I ever played, and I'm really playing with superb players. And it, this is what keeps... Uh, I was looking at it, I listened to a little bit of Jimmy Doyle. Jimmy, Jimmy was talking about... And I, I think the word he used was childlike, to be childlike. This is what sustains you, to be childlike, not to be childish, but to be childlike, to move like a child, to have the, 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 the openness of a child, you know, which in this business can be very, very painful to be open because people really do take advantage. Do you know, they take advantage of your open, they will get it, and they will use your weaknesses against you. Uh, luckily enough, along the way, I did make a few friends who, and the criterion of any friendship is an exchange of weaknesses. So now and then you'll meet somebody who doesn't use your weaknesses against you. And things like that sustain you. And after what you learn how to protect yourself. So then I had the good fortune to, to uh, bump into Mike Scott. I didn't know who they were, the Walter Boys, because I'd sort of hidden away, I'd sort of buried myself away. And uh, he rang up and he, he asked me to go in and do a session with Wimmel. And <laughs> I think I said to him, Who are you, the Walter Boys? Are you already so what? Are you? <laughs> and they were huge, like Mike was. Uh, and I think he loved that because <laughs> he realized that I knew nothing about them. So I arrived at the session and we had a great time. Like he really, uh, he enjoyed what I did and he made me feel very good and very comfortable. And uh, then he asked me to join the band, which was a great honor. Like I'll never forget the day he came out when he came out to the house and uh, asked me would I play with the band. And it was like, God, this is fantastic. This is a, a complete change of life. So I had a great time there with the water boys. Like, and uh, Michael, so he really encouraged the band to play music. Like every chance we got to play, like it, it, it happened. It happened in airports, it happened on the planes. When we got off the plane, we were sitting around waiting for people to pick us up. There was music being played. Get to the hotel, it'd be another session. Get to the gig, you'd be practicing. 
it was brilliant get on the stage do the gig music after the gig like that it's hard to believe but it was just one continual stream of music it was wonderful I had a great time mm. and then of course it came uh, life moves on and um, and it was then I think after the water boys that I suddenly dawned on me that I knew very little about what I was doing about my craft that I sort of picked it up and it came to me like the, the bit that did come to me came easy and I never really had to I never really what did what the greats talk about like if you talk about like as a drummer we say for instance if you talk about Elvin Jones and his like all those oh, uh, those black uh, drummers who really were so influential influential they talk about spending people like Tony Williams Elvin Jones they talk about spending eight years maybe eight to ten years locked away playing eight hours, 12 hours a day, practicing all the time. And they called it woodshed and they went down to a shed and they locked themselves in and they just played every day. So I said to myself, I never did that. So like, I haven't got the right really to be calling myself a drummer that I haven't put in the work. Mm -hmm. You know, so, I said, I'm going to do this. So I had to shed down the end of the garden. So I got it soundproofed. I put a kit of drums in it. And I started going down to the shed every day and practicing, just playing. Now, I didn't know where to go to for lessons, Brian. So I should have brought the book with me. But I came across this book, which was given to me, funnily enough, by Jimmy, Jimmy Doyle. We'll talk about Jimmy later on. Jimmy gave me this book. And it was really so accessible because it was so simple. It was a book by Humberto Morales called How to Play Latin American Percussion Instruments, which had nothing to do with a drum kit. This was timbales in Congress. Well, timbales predominantly. So I said, this is great. I can think. So I, I started, at the time I was learning timbales and trying to learn timbales in Congress. Again, Dublin is not conducive to learning these instruments, really. If You need to go to Cuba or somewhere else where these people proliferate that you can learn to take. Very difficult. But I, I picked up a couple of books along the way and I was trying to teach myself. And you spend hours and hours and hours and sometimes you go the wrong direction. But anyway, with this book, I decided that I would lock myself away, which I did. And then I learned, to, I, 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 I know what the beaten path means. The beaten path is, I went up and down so often down the garden that I had a path worked out like an animal track. You know, the beaten path into the shed. <laughs> And it, the missus found it very hard. She, like Olivia found it, uh, found it very difficult for me because I was spending all my time there because I wanted to do this. Because the children were sort of semi on their way with four children, two boys, two girls, fantastic kids, they were great. Olivia did a brilliant job with them. And um, they, were, they were okay. They were good children. They didn't have any serious problems. They were only half mad. <laughs> Not like that. <laughs> yeah, 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 not totally mad. So uh, this, uh, uh, this Olivia found it difficult that at this stage in my life, like I was over forty, mm. that I was actually going and trying to do this because I said I didn't want to grow old and have the tyranny of the shoulds. Mm. I should have done this and I should have done that. And why didn't I do this? And I didn't want to grow old and become bitter because I hadn't pursued something in life that would sustain me when I got older. So I spent a lot of time down the shed, Bernard, and I really worked hard at my craft. Now, I never became the greatest drummer in the world, but I did become a better player. And now I get to play with, with all great musicians. I get to play with them, which is fantastic. And your confidence as well. Oh, yes. In all aspects of your life. In all aspects of your life. But there was a few things I had to happen. I had to stop smoking and drinking and do all the things. Uh, I had to stop do stop doing the wrong things, mm. and then the right thing just happens. Sorry, I'm deviating again, but everything is relative. You know, everything is it's uh, well, as uh, Muddy Waters say, well, it's the same thing, <laughs> the same thing, the same thing. It is the same thing. So yes, that reflects on all aspects of your life. Then, so I was really delighted that I had spent all that time down the shed. And a funny thing again, coming back to Conor McGregor, the fighter. <laughs> um, 
I was in the pub the other night and someone said, yeah, they were, he was doing an interview and he was talking about the, the 10,000 hours. And I said, what? So, the 10,000 hours, it's the magic formula that if you want to become a master at what you do, you have to spend 10,000 hours at it. Whether it's Bill Gates, who was lucky enough to spend his time at the computer, and then when the computer world erupted, he was ready to do it. The same with the Beatles. They'd spent all that time, Jimmy was talking about the Star Club in Germany. Well, the Beatles were playing eight hours a day in Germany. They were doing eight hour gigs with breaks. And they spent an awful lot of time mastering the craft. So when the time came for them, they were ready for it. So, so it's funny. There you go, you get Conor McGregor talking about 10,000 hours. Then the, you find out the Beatles did it. Bill Gates did it. All the greats did it. And if you want to be a good golfer, you better start going up to the driving range and stand there like 10,000 hours. You know, McElroy, as a child, like, like they've spent it. You know, that's what you have to do. You don't wake up one morning. You don't wake up and suddenly be great. You have to work at it. I woke so, up this morning. <laughs> I woke up this morning, yeah. Didn't know what to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, fantastic. I was just reading, like, there's so many things that we have to talk about. Like, not just drums and that, you know. We, we talk about, like, the music business. And then you get the likes of Dylan. Like, look at the lyrics that man comes up. Did you, do, you, do you know the song Dignity? No. You know, I wrote down some of it there, Bernard. I don't know whether the, the reason it could go. I actually brought the lyrics with me, but it would probably take too long to read them. Tell us about Van Morrison. Van Morrison. Well, you have to. Van is like he's brilliant. You say I, the only uh, I had two uh, I can remember with Van. They were fantastic. Two gigs. Two no two episodes. Van were brilliant. What was the first one? Was it was it with Salt? It was with Salt? I think. We were doing this on on all. Uh, Philip King put together a program. Brilliant program. I should have brought the photograph. Jeepers, I keep forgetting these. A brilliant program called Salt, which he recorded in Temple Bar, which is a brilliant achievement to put it all together and get all Irish people. And he got Van Morrison to come in. And the story was that, that Philip picked up Van and was coming into the, the gig, you know, and Van was saying to him, what's the catch? What's the catch? You know, and uh, Philip was saying, now there's no catch, Van. It's just a bit of music. So uh, Van was the thing. But anyway, as soon as the car pulled up outside, the Temple Bar, the record button is pressed. Van doesn't take any prisoners. If I'm coming in here, you be ready. He walked in the door, into the hall, up on the stage, picked up the guitar, start playing. So that record button is not pressed. Sorry, but he was brilliant. So like, you were in the band that were back in the Yeah, days. yeah. And Donald, Donald Lunny was MD, another master musician. But, um. I don't like uh, Van and uh, I think like Van, he, he never does interviews and never talks about himself. But from what I know, and maybe it's not my place to talk about him, but Jimmy Doyle mentioned the name in his interview, Phil Solomons. Well, I think Van was managed by Finn Solomon, Phil Solomons and Van was ripped off from what we hear. That when Van, all those hits he had, Here Comes the Night and... Baby, please don't go. And like those songs he wrote that were brilliant, that were great hits in England. I think when Van went to America, he went with nothing. He had nothing. So, and became the biggest artist in the world. And uh, and I'm sure he got ripped off along the way. Everybody gets taken at some stage. So naturally enough, when you get ripped off, you have to sort of protect yourself. So he's got the the, the reputation of being. And he probably is, but I found him great. I went doing a recording session with him. And like, he just doesn't take any prisoners. He's just brilliant. He's just straight to the point. And, and he sussed you out like a flash, in my opinion. And if you're, if you're anyway, <laughs> like he's harsh, hell very rapid, you know. So he looks across at me, we're doing the, doing the, the thing, and he says, 
Are you not taking? Oh, oh, I had to sign a confidentiality agreement that would nothing, <laughs> nothing would be said about this thing. So I don't know whether I could say this, but it, it is good. So he won't mind. He says to me, "Are you not taking notes?" And uh, I sort of looked at him. And, like there's all these things flashing through my head. Like if I start taking notes, I'll have to put on my other glasses, and I won't be able, I won't be able to flare. I won't be able to see him because I was watching him, and I was watching his body language when he was going to stop and start. So I was following that, you know. So I looked at him, and this song came into my head: inarticulate speech of the heart that he wrote, the Van Rowe. Like brilliant, inarticulate. Can you imagine inarticulate speech of the heart? That's fucking brilliant. So I looked at him and I, I just did that. So he, he says to the bass player, you cue him, you cue him. He got the message, you know that. But uh, I really enjoyed uh, working with him because he is, like, he's a class act. Like, you put on the cans, right? He, you hear the door opening and you hear the footsteps coming up and he comes in, he walks straight over to the guitar and he picks it up. He just nods at everyone, bang. And you hear it in the cans and you know you're in the premiership. You know, you're in the premiership. That's brilliant. Harmonica player, sax player, piano player, drummer, mm. singer, writer, arranger. I mean, what can you say? You've done a lot of touring with different artists. Yeah. Mary Black. Yeah. Yeah. Mary Black, huge. Like, that was another great gig because Mary, Mary's music was a lot quiet. Here we go to another extreme. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, again, we were talking about, Ben, about how lucky you need to be really lucky to survive in this business and I was extremely lucky. I got a set of congas. I bought a set of congas off some guy second hand. I forget his name, lovely young man. Uh, I, and I didn't have a clue how to play them. But I sort of, I figured out that you, you know, you could get a sound out of them. So, because Mary wasn't really looking for a drummer, she was looking for a, a quiet sort of thing. The congas really were ideal. And Declan Sinner, who was the, uh, Mary's MD at the time, I think he, that, that suited him really, something that was quiet. So, and, oh, Danny Smith. Do you remember Danny? Danny Bongos. Danny Bongos. Yes. Danny Bongos. Yes. Danny had been to London as a kid, and he teamed up with the black guys in London. It was fascinating, like, you know, and they took a liking to him because he was crazy. You know, so they took him in and they showed him a few things on the, the Congress. Mm -hmm. And at this time I was playing with Brush in, in the baggage. Danny arrived in the baggage in one night with a Congo under each arm. Shoes hanging off. Starving. <laughs> Living on the streets, I think he was, Danny. So Brush took, uh, Brush took pity on him. I said, come on, come on up and play with us. So Danny jumps up on the stage. And he frightened the life out of me with the congress, the way he was playing the congress. Like he was, he was, he was great and he was wild. He was wild, he was straight in off the streets. And uh, when he got on the kit, he was a fantastic drummer. That's why I didn't like him playing the drums at all. Get out of my kit, you know, because he, he'd blow you. He'd make it like, I felt like a gobshite. So uh, Danny was a great player. So he learned all these rhythms. So he showed me a couple of the rhythms. Fair play to him, he never hesitated about showing you of these African rhythms that these guys, these black guys, when he lived in London, he had slept rough in London too. And the black guys like took him in and showed him how to play the congas. And uh, he was great. So I learned a few things off Danny. And uh, that's what got me the gig with Mary, Mary Black. Mm. So I was very lucky mm. that I didn't know too much about them. So, I was in America one time down with Mary and I came across these books by a chap called Bob Evans about how to play conga drums and bongo drums, which are simple, very accessible. So this was great for me. So I, I, I improved, but playing with Mary was a great chance to play congas. And I, I, I added a bass drum and a hi-hat, which was very unusual at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was great. So I really enjoyed that. That was really different. And I got a chance to play a little bit of timbales as well. So it was away from the drum kit. So, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there, Bernard. You asked me a question about, I, I say, yeah. So that, I've done a lot of albums with Mary, which are super nice. She was a great artist, great well, singer. I told you this before, but I was down in 
Chile in South America for a month and I brought down a CD or a tape, I can't remember, with me of Mary Black. Really? And the only thing, because I couldn't speak English, uh, sorry, because I couldn't speak Spanish, yeah. I used to put this tape on all the time and you're, of course you've done a lot of vocal harmonies with her. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, I could hear you, I could make you out having worked with you before. Yeah. So it was really good, I really liked that album. She did some great albums, that, that, um, Last for No Frontiers. That's the one. Yeah, fantastic songs on it. Great songs, great songs. Jimmy McCarthy was at his, the height of his powers down too, writing songs. It was great. Anyway, um, yeah, I had a great time with Mary. It was after that I joined the Water Boys, and then after that I decided I'd do some wood shedding. Went down to the shed. So I was able to keep going, picking up a little gig here and there, and and now sort of things have steadied out where I'm playing with great players. At the minute I'm playing with Ed Dean and Tommy Moore. It's funny that you should show me that from the Facebook mm. thing, that old poster, Ed. Ed spent 27 years in London playing. Mm. And uh, has come back to live in Leitrim now, but he, what a player. It's just uh, astounding. It's great. Like, it's a great, it's a joy. And Tommy Moore, of course. Mm. Tommy is... The governor. Ah, the governor bass player. He's just superb. And a great singer. And Ed sings, and I sing, so we have this great three piece where we have this all three different voices singing. It's fantastic. Where do you play now? No, uh, we do um, a residency every Thursday night in Frank Ryan's in Queen Street. We also play in JJ's, which is the fantastic little club in town in Angel Street. It's a brilliant little place, the foremost jazz and blues place in the in the city, uh, run by uh, Brian Smith. Brilliant. Great little gig, really look forward to it. I'll be doing that on Friday week with Johnny Fein. There you go, there's another great guitar player I get to play with. James Delaney, piano player, fantastic player. I get to play with all these people, so I'm extremely lucky, especially at my age. But we were talking about Jimmy earlier. I'll just go on to Jimmy, because Jimmy was had a huge, in, a huge influence on all the drummers in this town. Like, I took lessons from Jimmy further down the road when I started to learn I got lessons from Jimmy Timmy Creedon learned them from Jimmy Downey got together with Jimmy Jimmy is just a, as you know by his interview like it's just a, a wealth of information not only great stories but if you if you need to learn anything about drums it's just it's just a mother load of information it's brilliant and um, have there been times in your career that you probably fell foul of certain uh, habits or say alcohol I was, a lot of people do a lot yeah, of musicians do yeah, yeah. yeah. I was, you're asking me did I fall foul of any like habits mm. I was very lucky not to get into the smack or become a serious coke addict or anything that because in the music business that's everywhere that was everywhere like I remember Henry saying that Henry McCullough saying when he went to America when they went to do Woodstock with Joe Cocker that the limo that picked them up, your man just says, oh, they open the drawer and there's everything you wanted, smack, cocaine, gargle, anything you wanted is there. Very hard to get money out of these people, with all the drugs in the world. You know, and very easy to fall foul. And also another point is that when you've traveled a long way and you've, you've got to do a gig, you try, you want to be at the height of your powers. And if you're feeling really tired and wrecked, if the stuff is there that's gonna just perk you up for your gig, naturally enough, you'll, you'll go for it. And there's lots of people have fallen foul to it. Luckily enough, I didn't. Mm. I was blessed that we never made enough money. Yeah. That we could never afford to kill ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> if you know what I mean. Good, good yeah, yeah, good we were point. blessed that we never made any money. Mm. And uh, and then luckily enough, I, I'd, I'd gotten married to a, a wonderful girl, and we had a few kids, so my responsibilities went elsewhere. I did drink, and I, I, I probably drank to excess, like all of us, but eventually I stopped that. I did smoke hash, and I smoked that to excess, until I got to the stage where I was starting to get paranoid, you know, so I stopped that. I went out to see Matthew Shields, who was a healer. Matthew was great, power of the hands. I was having a few problems with arms and limbs. Or getting, oh. He sorted that out me, and I used to think that smoking house would give me energy. 
But Magic said, no, no, no. He says, it's depleting your energy, really. So I stopped that. And I stopped drinking. And then eventually, your head turns around. You start to see things a lot clearer. And I would never go back to doing anything. Nothing. The thoughts of it would leave me alone because I'm, I'm having a great time playing music. I really am having a ball, Bernard. Yeah. I'm playing better than I ever played. And I'm really playing with great people. I know I've said this, but I can't emphasize this, emphasize it enough to say that if you do put your time into your music, that it will repay you. That doors will open where there wasn't doors before. And you're like, I'm blessed. Here I am at my age, having a ball every time I go to a gig. I have a ball. I'm just sorry that I never stopped smoking earlier because I can't sing as well as I used to be able to sing. But that's okay, I'm still singing. <laughs> I'm singing very well. Tell us about your time with the uh, Platterman. The Platterman was great. Great, because again, I was so lucky when the gentry fell apart, when Carr went off to do Superstar and all those other things and the band sort of drifted. I fell into the Platterman. It just so happened they had a fantastic drummer, but he got caught up in other things again. Okay. And so I was asked to play with him. And again, I was very lucky. It was at a time when I was at a very low ebb, uh, like confidence was and all that, you know. So I got, a, I got a gig, and Rob, of course, Rob Strong, powerhouse Rob. Wow. Like, th this was brilliant for me to get to play with a bass player, the standard of Rob, and the vocal power of him. Like, it was just fantastic to get into a band with that sort of standard of musicianship. And they great, they had a brass section. Pat. Ray. Ray, John. and of course John Trotter. Philip Donnelly on guitar. Philip Donnelly on guitar, he came in later, Philip. Mm -hmm. If I remember right, we got him the gig, didn't we? <laughs> or did I get him the gig, and he got you the gig. Yeah, yeah. So I was responsible for that. Yeah. Don't blame me, Bernard, don't blame me. <laughs> yeah, Philip was at the height of his powers then too. Yeah. He was yeah. all set to go to America, and he conquered Nashville. Had a great time out there. Got to play with all the greats out there. The Everly Brothers and... Fantastic. Neil Diamond. Uh, Neil Diamond. It's mm -hmm. like, it's just unbelievable. Yeah. Like, like the state, so... Like any bands that come along now are standing on these people's shoulders. They broke the ice right. and raised the level of uh, musicianship. That's what this whole project is about. Yeah. This is, that's exactly what yeah. this is about. Yeah, you see, for, for, for anyone now to succeed, the problem is that technology, can, you can like press a button now and you can get this, that and the other. Mm -hmm. And for, you can get away with that for so long. Mm. But I mean, really, the, the, the true thing is you sit with your instrument and you go back mm. and you listen to the old blues players and you listen to all the things that came before you. You know, you listen to the older musicians and you learn how to play your instruments with the basic essentials. Not, you kick a button and suddenly there's 12 guitars playing behind you, you know, and you fall off the stage and the guitars are still playing. <laughs> How's that? It's great. <laughs> don't mention it. The initials? No, don't mention it. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> do, do you... I mean, you know, you've had a great. It sounds like you've had a great life, no? Like most musicians have, because. But we always ask them at the end if there's any regrets. Now you can say it, or you can keep it to yourself. But do you have any regrets? No regrets at all. For some peculiar reason, Ben, you go through like when I went through the dark night of the soul. You feel like that. You know, is this what it's all about? This like, you, I never. Uh, I achieved nothing. You know, mm. but out of that, if you want to live, first you have to die. It's a great expression, the greats talk about that. In other words, you have to really die and then come back, start again. So I was lucky enough to get all these chances. I was really blessed, you understand me? Mm -hmm. But it's a very difficult thing to explain that I had a great time as a young fella and then I went through a bad patch and come out of that and still managed uh, to clock in the hours necessary that I wanted to do to try and improve myself as a musician and raise a family. Very few people can say that. Poor old fellow is dead. Gary is dead. Do you know what I mean? Like so many of this, uh, all the victims, poor Jimmy Faulkner, gone. Yeah. You know, people who were great musicians and who would love to be here sitting with us now. Yeah. 
and maybe going off to do a gig tonight. Like, remember that when Philo, towards the end, all he wanted to do was just go into a pub and just do a gig with good people and forget about all the madness that he got caught up in with the drugs and all that lifestyle of totally alienated from reality. It's just, you know. So I'm having a great time, Bernard. I play with great people. My feet are still on the ground. I have children. I have grandchildren. I have everything. I have a great wife. I have everything. I go down for a game of golf with people like yourself and Brendan. I get to play with nice people. I get out in the green. You know, it's green, the healing colour. We don't have any phone calls. We go out and have a great time. I come back. And I was Jimmy, like there's Jimmy Doyle, still practising. Jimmy's 75 or 76 years of age and still doing hours of practice. Because the music sustains you. Drumming especially is a very, very primitive instrument. I mean, the original instrument is the voice. That's the first instrument. Ah, as they say in Buddhism, Om, Om, it's the first. Then along came the wood and the skin, the drum. All other instruments come after that. So the drums are a very primitive instrument. And as uh, Mickey Hart says, if you, if you ever read his book, Drumming at the Edge of Magic, where he goes back into the history of drumming, it's brilliant. What, every drummer should read this book, Drumming at the Edge of Magic, because it'll make you feel good about yourself as a drummer. I was lucky enough to read this book and get a great book. Oh, yeah, I'm a drummer. I'm not just a bloke in there banging things and making noise. I'm a drummer. These were very, very powerful musicians, drummers. So you seem passionate about it, Noel, as you've always been. I've known you a long time. Oh, you have not lost your passion. I've, I've become more passionate about it when I realise that I actually do something. Like, Brenda, when I do a gig with, say, Ed and Tommy, or with Ed and John Quarney, whoever it may be, we transport people. For two hours, we make people forget all their problems. And for two hours, we can take them somewhere else. And I've seen it in people's eyes. They get lifted and they get taken somewhere else, away from the world, away from all the madness. And, and they feel you. great with the music, the power of music. They don't know whether we're playing an F-flat, the minutes, varnished, the polished. Or it's, a, it's a vibe. Music is a wave and it affects people. Drums are the same. Drums strikes a particular area of the brain. And it, you walk, you put a load of kids in a room and put a drum kit in the corner. Eventually, every single one of them will go over and start playing that drum kit, making so-called noise. Because it strikes a particular area of the brain. Like, it was great therapeutic power. We call it doctor gig. You go to the gig, you don't feel so good. You play the gig, <laughs> you feel superb, you feel great. You're up half the night, you can't go to sleep because you're buzzing. You know, so, of course I'm passionate about music. We can, we can lift people. Not even politicians can do that. Not even Dennis O'Brien could transport people for two hours. Unless he's had loads of bread, you know, there's a million quid. Oh, Dennis, great, thanks a million. <laughs> I'm in a great place. Yeah, yeah, what a bloke. But I can do that. For nothing. We have the power, when you play with a band, you have the power to transport people to somewhere that's a wonderful place where they forget all their problems. Their mobile phone is switched off. Everything is forgotten about. And you don't have any buttons to help you? No. Don't kick anything. We do it just with a pair, two pieces of wood for me and skins and bits of wood and I kick things and I make noise. For the boys, they pluck strings and there's no technology there to there's no it's it's done with integrity and done with dignity and it's, it's there's no falsehoods about it and people get it Words people are get flying it flying out like endless rain into a paper cup they slither as they pass they slip away across the universe pools of sorrow waves of joy are drifting through Mind, possessing and caressing me Jai Guru Deva oh. Nothing's gonna change my world Nothing's gonna change 
changed my world Nothing's gonna change my world Nothing's gonna change my world Images of broken light Which dance before me like a million stars That call me on and on Across the universe Thoughts meander like a restless wind Inside a letterbox They tumble blindly as they make their way Across the universe Jaguru Limitless undying love which shines around me like a million suns that call me on and on across the universe. Sounds of laughter, shades of hate are ringing through my open views, inviting and inciting me. Jaguru. Jaguru 